I am your host, Jessica Aldridge, and it is my honor to welcome our guest, Ashley Kosak, Research and Project Management Fellow at Frack Tracker Alliance and CEO of Green Arrow. Welcome to Eco Justice Radio. Thanks for having me. I'm yeah. so excited to be here. I'm excited because hydrogen is this hot topic. And I know that you've been working on this for a while and getting to understand this. Um, I, I am very excited to hear what you've been doing and where your concerns lie when it comes to hydrogen as a potential fuel for, you know, many alternatives of, uh, in the way that we may be, be using coal or gas or fracked oil, you know, uh, so let's start with the basics first. What is hydrogen? Yeah, um, hydrogen is one of the smallest atoms on the periodic table. So the uh, periodic table goes from one uh, proton and nucleus to 103, and there's all these different metals on it. Atom, or hydrogen is the smallest one within that scale, and it's one of the most abundantly uh, common gases on the planet. And it's already being used, right? So where where are they using hydrogen currently? Yeah, so hydrogen has a bunch of different uses. Um, in my experience in the aerospace industry, it's been used as a liquid fuel for rockets. It can also be used for welding. Um, it's put into fertilizers, hydrochloric acid, um, liquid hydrogen could be used for uh, cryogenics. It's used for like superconductivity. Um, and then one other use is transportation, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Yes, we are. Um, so how is hydrogen produced and captured? Yeah, so uh, there's a few different processes within hydrogen production, but what we're going to be focusing on is primarily blue hydrogen. Um, Blue hydrogen uh, is created through a methane steam reformation process, which means that water is superheated to 700 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and it is separated from the hydrogen, uh, I'm sorry, water is superheated to 700 degrees Fahrenheit, and in an H2O mo molecule, the hydrogen is separated away from the oxygen, and then that hydrogen is harvested and used for energy. Um, the way that this gets superheated is using methane. And so uh, methane is really the primary fuel that is powering this process. Um, so frack gas. It, yes, gas, like fracked gas um, from the ground, the same thing that we're also hoping to eliminate as we transition towards a more green economy uh, is the basis for how hydrogen gets made. Uh, it is the way that over 90% of hydrogen is created is through uh, energy sources like methane. Another one would be coal. So- um yeah, if we talk about like the hydrogen color wheel, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So stop me anytime. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the hydrogen color wheel in a moment because for those listeners, there's so many different types of hydrogen and they earmark them by color. So we'll definitely talk about that in a second. Cool. Um, yeah, that's basically the foundation of how hydrogen is created. The biggest difference between um, like the normal methods of hydrogen creation and the newer methods that are emerging is the introduction of carbon capture and storage. And so that's really the differentiator between what, what makes it a blue, a quote unquote blue, uh, clean hydrogen production process and the uh, historic version of how hydrogen has been created is the implementation of carbon capture and storage. Um, which is more of an emerging technology, really, than something that's been industrialized and uh, scaled up to uh, be implemented at all hydrogen facilities. It's very much an emerging technology. How has it been stored and transported? Yeah, so hydrogen, uh, it gets stored into storage tanks after it's been created. So after um, the water has been superheated, those hydrogen molecules have been separated, they're then going to go through a series of uh, 
cooling chambers that's going to um, bring them down from that super critical point. And then they'll get stored within um, a bunch of like canisters that hydrogen uh, can then be like, they're just like uh, really good holding cells for hydrogen. Um, as far as transporting it on a large scale, the most common methods for transportation would be like trucks that have these storage tanks on them. Uh, a different method that's been introduced lately is injecting hydrogen into methane pipelines, but that's not something that's been widely scaled yet. So it's it's essentially um, large trucks that are transporting it between different locations, between its production and where it's ending up being used. And don't they have like um, same place with like natural gas where they do underground storage tanks or just tanks themselves? Yes. Yeah, they do. And but what's the issue with this? Like if it sounds great, right? We're able to grid it. It's it's a, a an extremely abundant material. And but then what are the issues, the storage issues, options that we've been talking about? Because you said hydrogen is a small molecule. So yeah. is it prone to escaping? Yeah, definitely. Um, one really good analogy would be a water bottle, right? So um, on a water bottle, you have a diff you have threads at the top, and when you put the cap on, the cap is what seals it shut, so that you know you turn your water bottle upside down, it's not going to leak out. Um, so let's take now uh, that water bottle and replace the water that's in it with hydrogen. Uh, water molecule it is large. It's got oxygen, which has like sixteen. Uh, atom or yeah 16 like protons and nuclei within it um and then hydrogen which uh is like bonded to that oxygen that's a large molecule so it's not going to want to slip past the threads that are on that water bottle that's what's going to hold it in for hydrogen itself it is such a tiny tiny molecule that something um as simple as like plastic threads like that, that can't hold it in um, so when we talk about some of the issues within uh, hydrogen storage or even carbon storage, um, the biggest thing is that uh, these molecules can slip past uh, leak points. It can slip past any place where there's supposed to be a sealing surface. And so uh, what I've seen in my past as an aerospace engineer is that hydrogen wants to leak because it is so tiny and it's also difficult to detect in that way, um, which means that not only do you run into issues with um, the efficiency of your storage, but uh, with hydrogen being a flammable gas, it could also be more dangerous. The same thing goes for carbon. Um, carbon can slip past through some of these ceiling points as well. And so now, now you end up with this situation where your storage method is inefficient for something that wants to leak. And um, that's the biggest concern with hydrogen storage or even injecting it into methane pipelines is that, you know, you um, you run the risk of losing, losing all this energy that you've just put a lot of energy into producing. So storage is a difficult, a difficult um, subject for hydrogen. <laughs> Sounds like they may not have that component completely figured out at this point. I mean, I've heard that if it goes into the the pipeline infrastructure for natural gas, those, those pipes, I mean, they do this with other f fuels as well, right? They do this with tar sands, putting it into natural gas pipelines. Um, but if that, if that material, if hydrogen is mixed with the natural gas pipeline, I've read that um, any mixed fuel uh, over 5% in this case can brittle that pipe, can make that pipe um, weak, allowing the hydrogen to be able to seep out. And what you're saying is then we have the potential for an explosion. Right. And uh, leaking, leaking is something that is going to be persistent no matter what industry we're talking about. I think that that's the biggest thing that I learned as a mechanical engineer is that like um, foreign objects can get caught on the things that close together so that they can seal it. Um, like there's, there's all different types of defects that can be present within the, uh, the systems that are being created for hydrogen pipeline fractures is one of them. So, uh, when we talk about embrittlement, what we're talking about is there's a pipeline that has, um, that has 
metal on the inside and hydrogen is such a small molecule that it can actually slip into any empty spaces between uh, between the microstructure of that metal. So hydrogen will want to uh, slip in and then it can cause uh, cracks. It creates weak points within that metal and especially within a pipeline where the pressure could be upwards of 20 PSI, 50 PSI, that means um, there's 50 pounds per every square inch that exists within that pipeline. That's a lot. That's a lot of energy that's um, required to safely keep that pipeline secure and strong. So when you get hydrogen mixing in and embrittling that metal, you run the risk of creating pinhole leaks, uh, which could would be a huge issue because hydrogen is so susceptible to leaking. Uh, it could create cracks, or in the case of an earthquake, uh, it could become it could be so brittle that it you know it cracks. And that's the biggest concern with this is that not only uh, do we not have the technology to detect leaking on this type of scale, like you need to detect leaking across the entire pipeline for hundreds of miles of pipeline uh, in order for it to be effective. But if there is a leak, refurbishment of that uh, of that pipeline is a huge project and it's an expensive project too. I was going to ask about that because people would be like, well, we'll just refurbish the pipes to make them better to be able to transport this. They'll say that that's worth the investment uh, to move forward uh, with this as a potential alternative fuel. Um, but you're saying that's a huge project and you're saying that's expensive, correct? Yeah, and it's um, it's all about determining what has the highest return on investment. Yeah, everything's always gonna have an investment, um, whether it be hydrogen, methane, electrical grid, but we need to consider some of the long-term goals that we have for decarbonizing the energy grid and projects that invest more money in reinforcing the existing methane pipeline structure, um, I would say aren't the wisest place to be investing money. You're not going to get as high of a return uh, versus investing in the electrical grid, making that more accessible to communities, improving the way that we store it. Those are all things that could have long-term solutions. And there's a lot of efforts happening in the background to improve the design of that infrastructure. And so we should be leaning on those improvements instead of trying to rapidly refurbish the old existing infrastructure that isn't really equipped to be handling this emerging technology. You know, it's sort of like um, you we only have so much time to work on these projects and there's om- only so much capital to be dedicated towards these projects. Uh, so ensuring that where you invest that time and capital aligns with like the priorities that we have for decarbonizing the economy and reaching uh, like 2.5 uh, degrees. You know, I, I'm not going to get that number right, but you know, it's like look at look at what uh, we've set as the critical milestones for a decarbonized economy and make sure that the projects align with that. And I don't think hydrogen and the production of greenhouse gases that comes from hydrogen is uh, necessarily aligned with those priorities. Why is the oil industry pushing this as a fuel solution replacement for oil and gas? Uh, The oil industry is interested in hydrogen as a fuel solution replacement because it allows them to maintain the existing infrastructure that they currently have, Um, especially within some of the more recent bills. And we're going to get into this later, but there's there's funding allocated towards uh, rebuilding infrastructure within the fuel industry to accommodate hydrogen. And there's also funding within the automotive industry to create facilities to make hydrogen fuel cell cars. So each of these industries that have been longtime players within oil and gas now have incentive to put their efforts towards hydrogen, which is just using oil and gas. Um, So it allows for them to get more funding um, while also saying that they're creating uh, clean emission vehicles, clean emission energy. They're saying that this isn't going to create any greenhouse gas at the end of the process. And maybe that's true from the standpoint of looking at the tailpipe of a hydrogen fuel cell car and trying to determine if there's carbon coming out of it. 
But when you look at it from the whole life cycle of hydrogen, uh, that math actually does not check out. It actually creates more uh, more emissions than if you just burned the methane. Um, and so that gets into why this, this process doesn't necessarily like sniff, pass the sniff test is because you put uh, methane energy into creating hydrogen so that you can use the hydrogen as another energy form. It's just sort of like it's redundant in that way and you lose efficiency with every step of that process. What are the three major areas, the items that they want to start using hydrogen for as a replacement for fossil fuel? Yeah, hydrogen, um, for the most part, on a broad consumer scale, is being looked at as an alternative fuel for electric vehicles. These are called hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. In other cases, um, it's looked at as a possibility for power generation. Uh, so nuclear reactors could be an example of power generation as well for hydrogen. Um, another, another method of... Um, using hydrogen that I've more recently seen is using it as a storage source for extra energy within the renewable grid. So hydrogen can be stored within those storage tanks and it can be stored for a long term and those storage tanks can be scaled up to a larger scale. So it's being looked at as an effective uh, method of storage for extra energy. Um, but it still needs to be put into that hydrogen state. And then that hydrogen state still needs to be converted into an energy. So it's more like a intermediary medium that hydrogen could be used for, um, not necessarily an energy creating method. And a storage uh, situation that's actually safe. Too. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, maybe maybe if it's like a, like something above ground, I'd be like... Mm. <laughs> but if it's underground, I, I do have my, uh, I've got my skepticism. Uh, I got mine too. I mean, we're going to take it to the break in a second. Um, but yeah, let's everyone stay tuned. We're going to talk about, is it really truly a clean alter, uh, a clean fuel alternative? You know, what are the politics here? What's the greenwashing that's happening? We're going to talk about those colors and then I'm going to, you know, I want to also touch on some above ground storage and what happened in Lebanon with an explosion only a few years, a couple of years ago that happened due to, due to storage of ammonia, which is from hydrogen. So we'll be right back. We are back to talk about hydrogen, get to know it a little bit better, this fuel that's becoming really a popular topic in today's world. And I really wanna know is, is hydrogen a clean fuel alternative? Ashley, why, what are your opinions? Why or why not? Uh Hydrogen as a clean fuel alternative, um, there's a lot of opportunity for narrowing the focus within how hydrogen is being used. So it seems like it's green. And that's why uh, this is something that I would consider to be heavily greenwashed, but also very convincing as a greenwashing mechanism. Um, and that's because within all processes everywhere, there's this thing called life cycle analysis. And life cycle analysis really seeks to take each step of your operational chain. So that starts with sourcing your materials, uh, getting them shipped to where you are, manufacturing them, um, then the creation of the hydrogen and uh, creation of the product that the hydrogen is going into. So each of these are steps that emit carbon. And when you look at that full carb or when you look at that full process, um, you can see that hydrogen actually creates more carbon emissions than uh, if you just used methane straight from the ground. And uh, that's why when we talk about this as a clean fuel alternative, um, the industry wants to keep your focus specifically on what is coming out of the tailpipe. And it doesn't want to look at anything at the beginning of the process. But if you want to be informed about the um, carbon emissions of a process, you do need to look at that whole life cycle. And that's the part that makes uh, hydrogen not as uh, alluring as it's been made to seem, is that it does create so many carbon emissions. So it, and it uses, as we see it right now, it uses coal and gas to be created. So if a process requires these uh, mined or drilled materials to power it, how can you really look at it as a clean process? The entire feedstock is coming from 
things that create more greenhouse gases. Um, so yeah, it's a clean fuel alternative in that at the consumer point, it doesn't create carbon emissions, but in the full creation of hydrogen, it actually is much worse. And, you know, in the research and development for this, you know, carbon capture storage, should we, as you were saying, should we be looking at spending that money and time on decarbon decarbonizing our economy? I mean, uh, always, yes. <laughs> you know, it's like, I think, I think no matter what happens with hydrogen, um, there will always be an opportunity to keep developing uh, decarbonizing technologies. And I'm really, really hoping that as like, because all of this money is being put towards hydrogen, it's a technology that I think is going to continue to develop, whether or not I believe that it has potentials for a clean energy alternative. Um, so <clears throat> I think, I think ideally, as long as uh, efforts that are going towards decarbonization um, are sustained, they're not defunded. Uh, this type of work can happen in parallel, but, you know, it's, it's, um, I guess it's like frustrating because when it, when we look at hydrogen versus like an EV battery, uh, they both have their own core issues that are associated with the materials that are necessary to build them. Uh, batteries use lithium ion, hydrogen uses precious metals like platinum. And so uh, between the two of them, there's no really better answer as far as like mining goes or like um, the impacts, the environmental impacts of that mining. It's like lithium, lithium ion batteries um, on one hand, they're so abundant right now in our current economy that there are opportunities for like recycling them. However, with hydrogen, there really isn't that same opportunity for like recycling the platinum within it or recycling the fuel cells that are within it either. Um, so it, yeah, I, I don't know if I actually don't know if I answered your question, but. No, you answered my question. <laughs> I okay, was wanting cool. to get into the EV stuff. Um, okay, cool. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Replacing it's, um, them with the existing ones. Yeah, right. Exactly. And it's like, it's like um, engineers, engineers right now have like this huge draw towards making green solutions, but they don't always have the background on the social justice implications of one solution versus another. Um, and so that's something I've seen within like my work as a mechanical engineer is that there are people who are really, really convinced by hydrogen, but they haven't sat down to have the conversations about the life cycle impacts of this versus a battery technology of this uh, mining process for, or of the hydrogen cre creation process versus solar and renewable energy or how effective the energy that comes from solar and wind can be used. Um, Before we went to the break, we were talking about hydrogen production types uh, that are actually classified by color. Uh, let's briefly discuss these types and their differences. The types include brown hydrogen, gray hydrogen, blue hydrogen, and green hydrogen. And let's just start with brown, <laughs> the bottom of the barrel. What is brown hydrogen? Where does it come from? Yeah, so um, yeah, there's, there's an entire hydrogen color wheel and brown hydrogen is considered to be coal source hydrogen. Uh, there's also gray hydrogen, which comes from fossil fuels. Blue hydrogen is the same as gray hydrogen in that it comes from fossil fuels, but blue hydrogen adds in that component of carbon capture and storage. Green hydrogen is renewable powers, which means that um, you're going to take solar and wind and you're going to take the electricity from that. And that is what's going to heat up that reformation process to that 700 degrees Fahrenheit so it can break down those hydrogen molecules. Um, there's also uh, pink or red hydrogen that's considered nuclear power and then white hydrogen, which is naturally occurring. But with the hydrogen, 90% of the hydrogen is coming from coal and methane currently, right? That is correct. Um, well over 90%. And the uh, carbon footprint of gray hydrogen versus blue hydrogen, they're basically the same. And then with with the methane, with the blue, the blue hydrogen, don't they rely on carbon capture and storage in order to, to sell this as a, as a green alternative? 
Yeah. And carbon capture and storage, um, it's it's been marketed as a few different things. Um, one other one other branding for it that I've seen is direct air capture, carbon capture and storage. Uh, there's a lot of efforts going towards carbon capture and storage at the moment because it's one of those key indicators for um, how environmentally conscious a company could be. But really, it's it's looked at as so important because of the current subsidies that exist around it. So if a company can reduce carbon emissions or do carbon capture and storage, they receive like $3 per uh, companies who quote unquote capture carbon receive $3 per kilogram of carbon that they capture. So there's a huge incentive for them to be capturing as much carbon as possible. But in this situation, they're using a carbon emitting process to do so, so that they can receive that, um, that, that um, subsidy or that tax credit. And um, that's why, that's why blue hydrogen right now is so incentivizing to some of the oil and gas companies is that they can receive that credit. So now they can boost their bottom line with it. Um, if they're doing carbon capture, what are they specifically doing and how are they, are they storing it? Yeah. Um, so for, for carbon capture uh, within like the hydrogen production process, as that hydrogen is being superheated to its critical point where it separates away from the H2O molecule, the carbon that is emitted from that process will go into a smokestack. And a carbon capture and storage uh, tool or machine, that's going to sit at the top of that smokestack, and that's what's going to capture it. When it comes to storage, there's actually not many proven solutions for it. Even for carbon capture, there's not many proven solutions. And so that's a huge, uh, I would say that that's like a missing plot point for blue hydrogen is that they're relying on technology that's not scaled and doesn't necessarily exist um, as effectively as would be necessary to make this a uh, carbon saving process. Uh, carbon capture and storage doesn't really exist within the U.S. It's mostly in development. Permitting for it also doesn't really exist yet. Uh, those are several years out. So um, all of the current efforts going towards blue hydrogen are they're advertising the concept of the technology, but they don't have the technology actually figured out yet. Okay. Is the cost to do carbon capture worth it? Because isn't it a very expensive method and it doesn't really weigh out in the end? Yeah, it's like one of those things where to create carbon capture and storage, it requires a lot of research and development similar to hydrogen. Um, the machines need to be figured out and you need to figure out how to manufacture them on a broad scale to meet like the expanding uh, scale of hydrogen too. Uh, so on top of that uh, research and development costs, you also have the operational costs of getting it installed, of uh, repurposing the current smokestacks so they could accept uh, carbon capture and storage machines. Um, and really when you look at the effort that is required to make that a viable technology compared to the return that you get, as far as how it actually helps the earth, you're barely, I would say you're barely even breaking even. So if there's so much energy, pun intended, going towards creating, um, hydrogen instead of renewables, um, you're sort of you're you're barking up the wrong tree. Like is it really should, like weighing out in the end, right? Right. It's like it why why put all that effort towards developing this technology when we know really the answer for what's necessary right now is to decarbonize and use electrical energy and convert our power grids towards electricity. Um, and so that really gets to the root of it is that it's sort of like distracting away from the actual solutions that we know will improve. Uh, the current situation, or at least like contribute towards a climate solution. Um, it's taking all that and like adding in blinders towards hydrogen, which is all being funded by fuel and gas. And that's a good, that brings me to my next question is, well, that is that green hydrogen. And it says, well, we use renewable energies like solar and wind, and in some case geothermal, but that comes from oil wells. Uh, why is that? 
breaking up the solution then if we can use renewable energies to create hydrogen what's the issue there so when you use hydrogen it creates an electricity right um within a, like a hydrogen fuel cell the reason why hydrogen is used within that fuel cell is because um through the process of that hydrogen sort of flowing through it, it's going to create electrons and those electrons are electricity. Um, so when you look at green hydrogen, really what you're doing is you've got a process where you're starting with solar and wind energy. That electricity is going to uh, power the thing that creates hydrogen. That hydrogen is going to be stored in a tank and then used in a fuel cell, which will then create electricity again. So now you've got this process where you've generated electricity, so you could convert it into a different thing, so you could convert it back into electricity. And from an efficiency standpoint, um, it begs the question, why wouldn't you just use the energy that you had initially created exactly, or the thing that you're going to power? And now you've gone through this process where like, like heating something up to 700 degrees Fahrenheit is a lot of energy. Water does not want to take in, uh, or water requires a lot of energy to heat up. And so getting it to 700 degrees Fahrenheit is like thousands and thousands of kilojoules of energy. Um, it is just, it's an energy intensive process. So why put all of that energy that's being created from solar wind towards this energy intensive process instead of towards an efficient product like a battery where the system has been created around getting as much energy um, usage as possible from, from uh, your feedstock and from your uh, electrical source. The other number that I read was that solar and wind use 20 plus one liter of water uh, uh, per megawatt hour of power produced. Uh, green hydrogen requires 5,000 liters of water, even if that is recycled water. It's still a lot of water usage just to create that energy. Big time, big time. And uh, there's been a lot of efforts recently towards uh, preventing desalination plants from being built up. And I think if we look at the uh, necessity of water within the hydrogen process, we're going to see that it has similar environmental impacts as desalination plants where, you know, there are waste outputs that come from it. It requires large infrastructure and you're pumping all this water towards this process when, again, like water, water has, I think, way better uses for its time than something like hydrogen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're, a little, we're a little limited on our, on our clean water supply. So yeah. before we go to the break, I want to talk about social justice impacts. I mean, we've talked about them throughout uh, this conversation, but I really want to hone in on that. What are the social justice impacts that we need to consider with hydrogen? So hydrogen is being looked at as a solution because it can be transferred into this individualized commodity source. Um, hydrogen as a fuel can be used within a hydrogen fuel cell for someone's uh, uh, I'm Toyota Mirai is an example. That's one of the vehicles that Toyota is making around hydrogen fuel cells. But the price of that is significantly higher than even an electric vehicle. So funding individualized hydrogen solutions is really something that only wealthy people would be able to afford versus updating public infrastructure so that buses and subways and like public solutions for transportation can be electrified and clean clean vehicles. Um, on top of that, when we look at where these industrial facilities often end up being placed is in locations where there's a higher demographic of people of color and the implications of that smokestack of the carbon emissions, that's not something that's going to end up in the backyard of a suburb where the people who buy this product will live or might live. Um, it, it's going to be placed in a place where people don't have so much power to determine what infrastructure is around them. Um, so from like a social justice impact standpoint, it's similar to what we've seen with oil and fracking in the past, where it's placed in, uh, in communities that don't necessarily have that political power to stand up for what they believe is like the healthiest solution for them. And then all those other things that we've discussed, that there's the risk of explosion, that there's a risk of pipeline uh, fractures. 
that there's the issues with carbon capture and where they're going to be putting that. Are they going to be injecting it into, into um, the earth? <laughs> yeah. And yeah, go ahead. Well, um, and this was actually something that we discussed was that hydrogen, uh, it gets converted into ammonia so that it can be stored underground. That's yes. what makes it, that's what puts it into like a liquid form that can then be accessed and separated again, and turned into hydrogen. So if you inject it underground, now you've got this highly explosive liquid that is pressurized. And in the case of a earthquake, in the case of a leak that gets uh, ignited in some way, anything that allows for oxygen to access it and a fuel source to access it, you increase your rate, your risk of explosion. And that could be disparaging for the communities around it. Um, you mentioned something about Lebanon and uh, yes, ammonia. the port of uh, Beirut in Lebanon uh, in 2020. Yeah. Was and that, that was the in, giant Yes, explosion. that's the giant explosion. Those were in tanks in the port of Beirut. No way. That was ammonia. I did not know that. from hydrogen. And um, they had 218 deaths, 7,000 injuries, 300,000 people were left homeless, and it caused $15 billion in property damage. That was ammonia. That was an ammonia explosion. It wasn't underground. It was in tanks in the port. In a way, I feel like that was even hidden, you know, I because when I, when I like think about that event, I'm told that, oh, well, there are just chemicals being stored in it, not there's this emerging technology that uses, uh, I'm sorry, like, I, I guess like when, when, when everything happened with Lebanon, it was already traumatic to see, but yeah. to see that it's using the same chemicals that hydrogen would be converted into as a storage solution, it really begs the question of like, do we even have the safety infrastructure around this, this material to protect people? I don't know if that's been developed rapidly enough, and I hope that it would be. Um, but that is terrifying. I had I had no idea. It is terrifying. Ammonium nitrate was what exploded. We will bring this conversation back after the break, and we're going to talk about what are some of the solutions, right? And we've been talking about EV. Uh, is you know is hydrogen actually scalable? What's happening? I mean, things are happening around the country. Uh, in Los Angeles, there's a scattered good natural gas plan that they're looking at transferring over. Um, what frack tracker is doing? So we have a lot to cover after we get back from the break. So those listening, please stay tuned with us and we'll be right back. Ashley, we just ended the break with talking about what the social justice impacts are. We talked about um, carbon capture and what that means, what the impacts of carbon capture could be and why the oil and gas industry is pushing hydrogen as this next best alternative as a, a green fuel. Um, can these companies like those doing transportation get carbon credit incentives by using hydrogen? Wouldn't that be an incentive to them? Like we definitely want to invest in this because we can get credit for this. What is, what's your opinion on that, on carbon credits and yeah, um, and this is going to touch on a little bit of the work that I've done for um, for my own company in the past. Uh, when you look at the conversion of waste biomass to a fuel, a lot of the money in that doesn't necessarily actually come from selling the fuel that you create. A lot of money from that comes from these subsidies, these carbon credit incentives. Uh, that has a higher rate of return than what I think you could actually sell the fuel that you create for. So within the economy of waste biomass, um, the thing that is allowing it to be quote unquote profitable or generate revenue or be scalable is these carbon credit incentives, not only from the US government, there's also marketing teams uh, everywhere. Like, yeah, um, but like well, people can say, I'm going to take waste biomass and I'm going to convert it into this energy and I'm going to capture this much carbon. They can take that amount of carbon that they expect to capture and they can sell that in advance. And then those companies can say, those companies that buy it can say that they have gone carbon neutral because they've purchased these green bonds ahead of the actual sequestration of carbon. So now you've got companies out there 
who are saying they're carbon neutral because someday that carbon will have been captured. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's happened now. And it doesn't mean that they've reduced any of their carbon emissions, which I think is the biggest priority that we have at the moment. Um, but they can do this with hydrogen, right? Is, is the point, right? Is that they're looking at carbon credit incentives by using hydrogen and, you know, that maybe that's just fueling the push for this. Yeah. Yeah. They like um, biomass can be converted into a hydrogen through breaking that biomass down into a methane and then using that methane to create gray or blue hydrogen. And so that's why hydrogen is a participant within this carbon credit economy that has emerged. Now, is hydrogen capture and use scalable enough to offset the other uses of oil and natural gas fuels? The the scalability of hydrogen really is rooted right now in the use of fuel cell cars. And the only state that has really created infrastructure for them to be used on a daily basis is California. But the rest of the country has not put in uh, has not put in this infrastructure that makes hydrogen um, hydrogen an equivalent to fuel for a car. Um, Right now, within the IRA bill, there's about $50 billion in subsidies for cars and fueling locations. Um, but this harkens back to, like, if we've got funding for climate solutions, why is it going towards creating this, this solution specifically for pe the people who can afford hydrogen cells instead of going towards a power grid that is accessible to everyone who needs it? I, I want to talk about our show is across the country. And there are infrastructure for hydrogen and there's um, something happening in New York. They're looking at it in Louisiana and Texas and Florida in California. And in Los Angeles specifically, there's this um, facility called the Scatter Good Natural Gas Plant. And it's supposed to be shut down. It's like a big thing, we're gonna shut down. We're not gonna use it for natural gas, but the city council is pushing it to be turned into a hydrogen plant. But wouldn't they still be using the fossil fuels like natural gas in order to create the hydrogen? Yeah, and that's why that's why this like hydrogen, I think, has become a really, really solid cover up for a lot of oil and gas companies is that they can take their already existing um, drilling infrastructure that they've been using for uh, removing oil from the ground and they can repurpose it for hydrogen, which means that they don't have to shut it down. And that's that's the big issue here is that this is allowing this existing oil and gas infrastructure to stay alive, to stay funded, stay subsidized by the government. Um, but it's all still creating carbon emissions from that fracking process, from take from creating natural gas that could be used for the process of creating hydrogen. So in a way, this uh these these uh, pushes for like hydrogen plants are also a push for continuing the funding of oil and gas oil and gas plants, and that's the big issue. Is that we need those shut down, you know? We need them closed. They're they're bad for the people around them. They have really adverse health effects. They release how much carbon per year? Methane leaks from them all the time. Like the longer that we keep these open and viable, the worse they're going to be for the planet and for the yeah. people who live near them. Talking about, you know, these oil and gas infrastructure and how they are affecting communities, you have done work for Frack Tracker, nonprofit organization that you've been doing research with. Just briefly state what they do and, you know, the resources that they're providing so that people know where these facilities are located and maybe some of these facilities are going to be potentially turned into hydrogen facilities. Yeah. Uh, so Frack Tracker has been so kind as to allow me to work with their team. Uh, basically what they do is Frack Tracker Alliance maps, analyzes, and communicates the risks of the oil, gas, and petrochemical development uh, within the U.S., but also uh, I've seen them do some work internationally. Um, and their goal really is to advance just energy uh, alternatives that protect public health, natural resources, and the climate. 
Um, so they support groups across the U.S. Um, through the uh, through the data that they've gathered, through um, even taking photos of some of these sites. Um, oil and gas companies they really try to keep the security tight on their drilling locations or their production facilities, and so Frack Tracker tries to or yeah, Frack Tracker really what they do is they um, they make this information accessible to the public because it is affecting the health, it's affecting advocates and researchers. Um, and so they provide that analysis to- And to where, those where do people get that, the map, the information, the resources? Yeah, they, Frack Tracker um, has a website called fracktracker.org. And if you go on it, you can even go look at where the existing- oil and gas infrastructure is near you. Um, they've got maps that are accessible where you just type in your um, your address and it's gonna show you immediately within your area what type of pipelines are near you, what type of fracking facilities are near you. Um, they've really put in a lot of effort towards uh, letting you know what type of pipelines are going underground near you and things like that. So. Um, and what's that? I know I we're short on time, so I just wanna make sure that we get to all the questions. What is the address for that? fracktracker.org. Great. And if we don't consider hydrogen as a fuel alternative, what is the best alternative in your opinion? I think you've already answered this, but we're going to hone in on a little bit more. What is the best alternative in your opinion? Do we have the solutions now or should we continue to use and invest in existing fuel options or these sort of newer solutions like hydrogen as a sort of bridge fuel? Yeah, the best alternative really would be investing money into the electrical grid to make it more reliable, especially as um, adverse climate events continue to worsen as a result of the already existing climate issues in the in the world. Not even the ones that are coming up, but just the ones that already are here. Um, we we need to make that grid way more reliable because uh, it it kills people every year when they can't access electricity, when they can't access heat. Um, so investing in the electrical grid and then also as a solution, like solar and wind, the prices, the prices have never been lower, right? Like they've they've really honed in their production process to make it as efficient as possible. So these are technologies that are broadly scalable and also can be uh, individually implemented. So people can put solar on their houses. They can generate their own electricity. So we should be putting more energy towards that generation, not towards these like broad scale fuel-esque solutions like hydrogen. Um, solutions. Are there other areas where you see hydrogen being an option for use um, that would be less impactful, like sea vessels or long haul trucking or even certain battery storage. Um, for example, I work in the waste industry and some large fleets like the trash vehicles, they haul very heavy material for long periods of time um, in very different terrain where fully electric fleet cannot yet meet their needs. Yeah, I really like the concept of like using hydrogen for a long-term storage for fuel cells. I think that that's actually a viable, um, a viable use for it, but yeah, um, sea vessels, same thing. Um, like things where you're not going to have access to a grid of infrastructure that allows you to ref refuel. So you need to bring all of the fuel with you. Hydrogen could be a good alternative to that. It produces electricity. You don't need to carry uh, huge storage tanks of methane and stuff like that. Like. This is something that I, I think could be um, a reliable alternative to fuel in that sense. But from a full fleet standpoint, as far as um, individual cars, that's where the scalability becomes questionable. Um, but if a fleet, like there, there was a city in Canada where they converted their entire busing system to hydrogen. Um, it is possible, but it's an intensive process and it's not very reliable. And hydrogen, again, has the tendency to leak 
So you still do have, even if, um, even if you can use it as a storage solution, you still run the risk of like losing efficiency just due to how, how leaky this material could be. That's a great point. What do you propose is the next call to action when it comes to hydrogen? Uh, don't be fooled, you know, just when it comes up as a um, potential way that we could reformat fuel facilities or as a individual solution where you'll have clean emissions, realize that that is all part of this major PR push from oil and gas and from automotive because the more that the public can be receptive to it, the more likely it is that they can sell to the public too. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be honest about the actual implications of hydrogen production. So um, biggest thing is just be aware that hydrogen, there, I guess within any um, within an, any engineering process, there's always going to be like pros and cons and pitfalls and gains, but uh, we we need to think about what the short and long term uh, effective solutions could be, and I don't think hydrogen is one of them. And so for us to be distracted by it right now uh, removes energy from uh, converting towards a fully electrical grid or a fully green economy. Like this is just not one of the solutions that fits well within that puzzle.